Hi, I'm Barry. This is Simplicity Zen Podcast. Today I have John Kijo, one of my Dharma brothers in the Clear Mind Zen Sangha. Hi, John. How are you doing today? Hey, Barry. How are you doing? I'm good. Good. Thank you. I appreciate you joining us today. Um, so you're a Dharma transmitted priest under John Soji Sorensen in the yep. Clear Mind Zen. And you have a, where are you living now? In Colorado. Colorado. And do you have a Sangha there? Yep, a very small one, but uh -huh. hopefully growing. Uh -huh. but it's still fairly new, so, but yes, we're uh -huh. getting there. Okay, yes. great. Um, so, kind of what I wanted to talk about today is first look at your, um, you know, your where you, you know, where you grew up, what the experience uh -huh. was like, how you got into Zen, and so forth. Uh -huh. Right. So, um, what your favorite color is, and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Um. So you grew up in the UK, is that correct? No, I was actually born in Africa. Um, Africa. Okay. Yep. And I, in Kenya, and I left Kenya when I was five, went to the UK, um, was in boarding school um, until I left the UK again at the age of uh, about 10. I went back uh -huh. to Africa, this time to Rhodesia, uh -huh. uh, where there was a war on. So my mother's judgment was questionable in that regard uh -huh. at best um <clears throat> but it's uh yeah so my my the few years i was there until like mid-teens or whatever um <clears throat> there was a war on i think that was part of why i got into um buddhism uh -huh. um and originally it was actually i got into meditation um, or what I thought was meditation, and probably for all the wrong reasons. Um, uh -huh. I read a guy, you may have heard of him, called Lobsang Rampa. Uh, is he uh, Tibetan? Uh, well, you, th there's the thing. Um, he claimed to be. Oh, that guy. I, I, do know, yeah, yeah. I do know that guy is, right. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people actually got into practice because of him, so we kind of owe him a debt, even though he was right. uh, a fraud, uh, uh -huh. to put it mildly. Uh -huh. Yeah, his real name was Cyril, Cyril Hoskins, uh -huh. and he wasn't a Tibetan. Um, but he wrote some very entertaining books, but they're all kind of full of magic and fantasy, and but presented as though they're non-fiction. He uh -huh. was trying to claim he was a, a genuine Tibetan Lama. Uh -huh. And so that, you know, that caught my attention, and I love the idea of psychic abilities and, you know, wanting to... It was a great distraction from uh -huh. what was going on around me. Mm -hmm. um, which I think is one reason why a lot of people get into practice, um, not necessarily for psychic abilities, but just just to uh, as a distraction, um, which right. is kind of ironic because it's a practice that's focused on paying attention to how things actually are. So it's, it's the opposite of being distracted. Mm -hmm. But of course, so I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. So as a young kid, do you do you have you know your first Africa? Do you have memories of that? um my what before i left the first time yeah when, uh, yes um i do actually i used to at one point i was living on a game reserve mm -hmm. and every evening i used to try and run out to the watering hole which was visible from where we were because mm -hmm. i wanted to play with the elephant and of course people had to run after me and, and drag me back because mm -hmm. so, it was not a good idea mm -hmm. you know they, they were not tame uh -huh. but, uh, yeah, but I've always always loved animals and uh, appreciated, you know, the connection between people and, and animals. Um, and it's, a, it's also part of my practice. You know, I think that we, how we respond to animals and the environment says a lot about, um, for want of a better term, the depth of our practice. Uh -huh. what, um, what brought your family to Africa initially? Um, well, my mom met my dad out there in Kenya, and uh -huh. they got married. Uh -huh. um, the return to uh, Africa, to Rhodesia, was because my mom was a nurse. And um, she thought that, you know, she'd get better treatment and conditions and pay and whatnot in Rhodesia. But, of course, ignoring the fact that there was a war on, so. yeah. <laughs> which was guys... kind of a big factor. Did you guys see the war? I mean, did you, was it something that was in your face or was something you like, you know, hear in the background type of thing? Oh, no, it was all around. I mean, uh -huh. there were days when, you know, bombs went off. There were 
you know, people throwing grenades into clubs and stores. And every time you went into any store, you know, even as a kid, as a teenager, you were searched, you know, for weapons. And also the, um, the, the propaganda was unbelievable. It was, uh, I mean, young kids my age, 14, 15, we were being taught that the best thing you could do was join the army. And they had call up at the age of 16. So they literally had children fighting. Um, and uh, this was praised as being the, the highest thing that you were fighting for freedom. And of course, it wasn't freedom. It was oppression. It was oppressing the majority population who were black. Was and it a civil war? It, it was. Well, it was the white minority. It was a white supremacist regime. It was basically a, a fascist regime. Um, what was the colonizing empire that? that oh, that was Britain. It was and, Britain. And in, um, I think it was 1964, around then, um, because Britain was starting to do the right thing and get rid of its colonies. So Rhodesia, the white minority, did not like that, mm -hmm. or at least you know, a significant number of them. So they declared independence from the UK mm -hmm. and set up their own um, white supremacist minority government and that's what led to the war mm -hmm. because rightly that didn't sit too well with the majority of the population mm -hmm. so yeah an interesting environment to to have some formative years in mm -hmm. what well, what was your kind of community did you mostly hang out with other local white colonists or did you mix with the um i well you, you were kind of forced to um, uh -huh. because there were strict laws about you know, um, uh, black people could not live in the same neighborhoods. They couldn't go to the same schools. Mm -hmm. um, it was that level of, of segregation. And I right, actually pure apartheid. It was yes, it was very much like South Africa, and um, and the two regimes supported each other, mm -hmm. um, with of course support from the U.S. and others um, <clears throat> in so-called secret. But um, I actually got into trouble with the police because I was making friends in the black community and I would go to, they're called Shabins, which are actually illegal drinking dens. Mm -hmm. um, and this was like at the age of 14 when you shouldn't really be drinking. But yeah, it was, it was more, um, I didn't, I didn't uh, believe the propaganda. I, I, I was totally against war. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as I was concerned, you know, these were human beings and um, I treated them as such. And for that, I got the attention of the police and I was literally uh, threatened with arrest uh, and imprisonment for the crime of fraternizing with natives, as they put it. That's horrible. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, even saying that now is kind of surreal and unbelievable, but uh, Yes, it was it was very much an apartheid regime. Did, did this just insane experience you have, do you think this was a catalyst at all to get into practice, just seeing the kind of the depths of human suffering and impermanence and so forth? Was you... Yes. Um, yes, it was it was I don't know how much overt suffering necessarily I, I saw that did that, but I think it was understanding even at that age, that a lot of how societies are run and how we are told things are isn't true. That, that uh, on some level, uh, some societies are functionally insane, I think is the only way to put it. And, and as a child or as a person who doesn't really have any power, apparently individually, you know, it's, it's traumatizing. I think it's traumatizing for a lot of people. I think the same experience is echoed with people in, in more modern times with the pandemic. I think, you know, I've read an article that uh, the majority of people now, it's reckoned, have some form of kind of low level PTSD. Yeah, I and, I, and I think that was the case for me. And so I was looking for a way to basically just feel better and to feel like I mattered um that i was important and i wasn't just you know this powerless um individual and that there was some kind of connection um i mean yes i i, I kind of got into it for the wrong reasons in some mm -hmm. ways but i think underneath that there, there, there's still that 
understanding that somehow we're linked, we're connected, mm -hmm. and that um, we don't have to buy into the insanity. That there is actually a way to to be in the world that at least minimizes our um, uh, enabling of that insanity. That we can actually see things as they are. I think that's the the main thing mm -hmm. from Buddhism, certainly. Yeah. Did you? Um, so your second stint in Africa. Did your whole family leave or did just just you leave? How did you get out of there? Well, it was my mom and dad had divorced. Uh, that's why we left Kenya in the first place. So it was just my mom and myself. I, I was an only child. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, we both left. Um, and then we went to Germany for a while. Uh, she was German and I lived there. And Germany was fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, we didn't stay there. <laughs> we then went to the UK. Mm -hmm. um the one thing about going to the uk though was there was quite a um flourishing buddhist uh scene happening there uh, certainly 1979 the early 80s um i got involved with uh first of all with a group called the friends of the western buddhist order fwbo okay. mm -hmm. yep um okay. and they were Tell us a little bit about them sorry go ahead well no what were you saying oh i was just gonna ask you to tell us a little bit about them Sorry. Well, there, there was some scandal in later years uh, <clears throat> about their their uh, founder and about mm -hmm. some of the things that were going on, but I never experienced that, and I found them to be incredibly supportive, and most of the pe people that I interacted with, um, they actually knew their stuff, they knew their dharma, and I have a lot of respect for them as a group, um, well, even today. You know, what kind of lineage was it? Is it Theravada, Mahayana, or they're they're Mahayana, um, but they also are quite syncretic. They use they have connections with um, some Vajrayana, like Tibetan mm -hmm. Buddhist mm -hmm. um, teachers and lineages, but also they incorporate um, a kind of uh, broad approach. So they're not sectarian in the sense of only being um, limited to one particular school or tradition, which I think was a nice introduction for me. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> because well, sorry what were oh, you going to say go, please go ahead sorry ah, no i was going to say that um you know, certainly as a beginner um i didn't know that much about buddhism and i think if i'd have come across perhaps uh theravadin practice first <clears throat> i would have been maybe put off because it's it's a lot more uh narrow in some senses the focus mm -hmm. i mean now i can appreciate it and understand it but i think as like a 15 year old 16 year old i wouldn't have appreciated it so for me at the time that kind of um broader approach was was uh helpful much more helpful so you and were still living at home while you were going to that center is that right i was um and then i started <clears throat> i think 1980-81 with um the london buddhist society mm -hmm. um <clears throat> And I'd started getting interested in <clears throat> Zen practice in particular. Mm -hmm. um, Is that why but, you made the switch? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I just I wanted to try and and see what Zen had to offer because, like, what I was reading, at least, uh, made a lot of sense in that it 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 seemed to cut through a lot of the. Um, how should we say? I wouldn't say extras, but it had a more, uh, to me at least, direct approach. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to be very focused on, you know, you can wake up, this is how you do it, and get on with it. And as opposed to, oh, yes, you might wake up in like, you know, 100 lifetimes. Right. Um, what, do you remember <clears throat> what you were reading? Like what books? Spoke um, I think Three Pillars of Zen. Right. That was my entry as well. Yeah, that was, a, I mean, it's a classic. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Three Pillars of Zen, I think... Um, I don't know if taking the path of Zen was out at that time, but yeah, yeah, um, but that that kind of uh, I like books that actually made me want to sit, that as opposed practical. to yeah, that, as opposed to sort of academic and and I found like a lot of the uh, Tibetan Buddhist stuff that I was reading it was so dry mm -hmm. and so academic and theoretical, mm -hmm. um, so I I liked the practicality of Zen, so I started with the Zen group at the London Buddhist Society, and they were uh, in the lineage of um, Soko Morinaga Roshi, as okay. a Rinzai teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so I was with them, I think, a couple of years. And then I actually came across um, 
an event where uh, a teacher from uh, White Plum, Meizumi Roshi's mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> organization lineage was mm -hmm. going to give a workshop. Mm -hmm. And I went along to that. And that was that was pretty much it for me. That was when I decided that, yes, it's it's <clears throat> at least for now going to be Zen mm -hmm. uh, that I'm going to concentrate on. When and you, um, when you practice, when you practice with the Morinaga group, did, yeah, was that were they pretty traditional Rinzai as far as the the robes and the and the stick and the sashin? Like, what what was the actual experience there? What, like, how well, thin was it? It, it yeah. um, at the Buddhist society itself, it yeah. was fairly. I mean, to me, it was pretty strict. Mm -hmm. um, but looking back on it now, <clears throat> in comparison to like formal uh monastic training at least mm -hmm. it was it was quite relaxed mm -hmm. um and it was more or less uh focusing on like a weekly sitting group mm -hmm. um and i think at one point like twice a week something like that and they would have occasional sashins and retreats but i didn't get to go on any of those so i can't comment on that how old were you at this point um oh uh, god hold on. how Still old a teenager. I think, I think about 18 at this point. Mm -hmm. Would you have direct um, experience? Would you have direct contact with a teacher or is it more just kind of showing up and sitting? There was, it was more showing up and sitting and there were some senior students um, mm -hmm. there who kind of guided things. Not very much contact with the teacher. And that's one reason why I went along to the workshop. Uh, it was with uh, Gempo. Mm -hmm. um, so he came out to London. Yep, or, okay. uh, I, I he did a workshop. I think I think Meizumi Yoshi uh, came along as well uh, briefly. But um, yeah, but I was but I was also the thing that struck, <clears throat> struck me too was in meeting actual Zen teachers. Um, there was a certain, and this might sound a bit woo, but um, <clears throat> it's been borne out again and again. So for me, it's it's. Um, a factor but i found that there was a sense of kind of presence about them mm -hmm. they were um <clears throat> it sounds odd but it was almost like you could you could in speaking to them being around it's almost like you had a sense of something um bigger than them yes mm -hmm. behind them at times mm -hmm. and that fascinated you know that i couldn't quite put my finger on mm -hmm. um <clears throat> but it, it fascinated me and i wanted to know more um <clears throat> so that was i mean if if i'd met a teacher with those qualities who was Theravadin or uh, vajrayana or mm -hmm. something like that i i very likely would have gone to that tradition instead mm -hmm. um and i think you know that meeting with the teacher is uh <clears throat> is so important you know it 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 um it can really kind of make or break whether somebody sticks with practice mm -hmm. did uh so were they just out there they were just out there for a seminar that they, they weren't they didn't have a practice center there or anything they were they actually had there was a sangha that was developing around mm -hmm. them um and i think at that time genpo was just starting things there it was called kanzeon sangha uh -huh. um and so there were quite a bunch of uh, enthusiastic people um mm -hmm. We were setting stuff up so we had um <clears throat> regular sitting groups and and then we started doing um excuse me my throat is really dry <clears throat> and then we started doing um sashins uh -huh. um with Genpo. Uh -huh. um i think so you would come out was, frequently yeah we, we, we were doing in the uk it was very much a european thing too because it was, wasn't just the uk um he would do like four sessions a year in the uk and he'd do about the same amount <clears throat> in other countries so like holland mm -hmm. and uh, germany and places like that i think it was germany but definitely holland mm -hmm. um and so a lot of students also they would go from session to session so they follow from like the uk to holland and... like touring them with the grateful dead or something yeah pretty much yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, did uh um, yeah. so were you going to college at this time or working or what what was your um, life like at this point i was i i 
let's see what was i doing at the time i think i was i was i was working mm-hmm. um so pretty much all of my vacation time uh would be spent on sashim uh so yeah i didn't have much of a, a vacation time for years and i did this um probably close to 10 years uh, i was doing like at least two sessions a year sometimes three or four mm-hmm. so and, yeah um what kind of practice so what was it, there was dokusan meetings yeah. with the teachers and what kind of practice were they having you doing like breath work or did they assign you a con though there was i mean the you probably know about white plum but they're um they have both soto and rinzai i mean they're right. technically yeah. soto and mm-hmm. a lot of their form is is largely so so um mm-hmm. but they also do 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 um koan training mm-hmm. so that they have that aspect as well so it, it's um you know they had people like bernie glassman uh tetsugan roshi and um <coughs> obviously Mezumi roshi as well um but yeah so that it was it was both soto and rinzai but technically soto shu so formal soto and very much so in terms of the form that was used Mm -hmm. and um but i mean as far as your interaction with the teacher what what kind of practice did they assign to you early on oh um i i started with um breath counting Mm -hmm. um and then there and then from there it changed and at times i was doing um shikantaza just sitting Mm-hmm. And at times I was doing uh, koan training. Mm-hmm. Like during, so, the session, during the session when the teacher was there, maybe you did the koans then? Yeah, I do. it was, I mean, certainly I think it's um, difficult to do koan work if you don't have some kind of uh, fairly regular input with the teacher. Mm-hmm. I mean, that could just be me. You know, no, you're right. I'm a slow yeah. learner. But... <laughs> But um, yeah, I think it's kind of the point of the practice, really. At least, yeah, it's uh, that. That's a good point. It's not just um, a question that you answer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's much, much deeper than that. And a lot of it is is your interaction with the teacher and actually showing your understanding. You know, not Mm -hmm. just talking about it. It's very easy to talk about realization or understanding or insight or whatever, Mm -hmm. but actually showing it is is a whole different ball game. Mm-hmm. Did you uh, do Jukai or anything like that during this time? Yes, I did uh, Jukai, I think, within a couple of years of starting with um, that group. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I did, uh, I was ordained as a priest in 1990, 1991. While still in UK? Yeah, yeah. The actual ordination was in Holland at the end mm-hmm. of a, a month long retreat. Uh, but yes, I, I was still living in the UK. Mm-hmm. And um, so did he, so he would visit, you know, fairly regularly, but was there a local like senior teacher that or senior student that kind of ran things? How, how did that work? Um, I think it was pretty much focused around the session mm-hmm. at that time. So there wasn't like a daily group, a, a group you would go sit weekly with or anything like that? Oh, yeah. No, we had, we had local sitting groups. In fact, I, I ran a, uh-huh. a local sitting group. Uh, I see. And so, yeah, they were very active um, and they were all over. I think we had probably three or four just in London alone. um, And then some more, I think, in Brighton and places like that. But um, yeah, so it was mainly focused on on like the weekly sitting groups. um, Mm -hmm. And we do an occasional uh, like weekend sitting or as as Zenkai, like an all day sitting. Right. Uh, And then apart from that, it was focused on uh, Sushin. Mm-hmm. But, so but, what, uh, uh, tell me a little bit about Gimpo. What, what was he like? What uh, you, you talked about his expansive quality, but I've, yeah. I've never met the guy. What, like, uh-huh. What's his personality okay. like? You know what's? Well, seems- I don't. I, I don't know what he's like now. Um, yeah. But, but when I met him, um, and looking back now, I can I can say quite easily that he was one of the um, clearest uh, Zen teachers or clearest teachers I'd, I'd ever encountered. Mm-hmm. And, and I still say that. Um, <clears throat> the problem, though, um, was that as things grew and mm-hmm. as the Sangha became more organized and larger and mm-hmm. more events and things like that, I, I think 
a kind of inner circle developed around Genpo, which, you know, it tends to happen mm -hmm. um, in institutions. And at some point, he kind of lost his way. He lost touch. And he went from being the clearest, one of the clearest Zen teachers I'd ever met, mm -hmm. um, including for a long time afterwards, to being um, <clears throat> quite problematic, um, mm -hmm. or very problematic in several ways. Mm -hmm. um, and it was around, so it was around, I think I was with him about 14, 15 years, mm -hmm. uh, training with him. And then at that point, I just, I had to leave. Mm -hmm. um, because it had changed so much in such a negative way that um, I couldn't in, in any good conscience stay. Did you ever go out to, to their center in Utah? Were they you're in Utah, right? Yeah, they, they had one in Salt Lake City. Um, I was invited to go out there. I didn't actually make it out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so no, all, all of my experience with them was in uh, the UK and, and Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, so when you guys split, did you did you just fade away or did you did you tell me you were leaving? Did you guys have a acrimonious uh, party? Or... You, you want the juicy gossip, huh? Do, uh, I mean, if you're comfortable talking about it. Uh -huh. I mean, well, I mean, it's not relevant. We don't have to talk right. about it. I mean, and, and not much of this is, is hidden because um, yeah. obviously it came out mm -hmm. um, at a later point about what was going on or some of what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, and Genpo was supposed to disrobe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I think, well, at the time, I just kind of stopped going to things. Um, mm -hmm. And I was kind of trying to process what was going on for me. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then when I did, I, I kind of clarified for myself, no, this is, you know, this stuff that's going on is wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not right. Um, and I tried to Speak to me. I actually tried to speak to Gampo about it, and I think one of the, the deciding moments was when I was told by whoever his secretary or whatever at the time was that, oh, sure, you can get to talk to him, but you have to pay uh, for a ticket to an event to do it. You have to pay like several hundred dollars uh, to talk to him, and that was it for me. That was, you know, no, you're, you're, he's no longer a Zen teacher at that point. I mean, you know, a, a, a student, a fairly senior student in terms of at least time and training, mm -hmm. being told that the only way they can teach talk to their teacher is if they pay a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, that to me was too much. Um, and then I tried talking to other Zen teachers about what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I was promptly blacklisted um, by some of these organizations, which is ironic because I saw some of these same Zen teachers um, not that long after, a few years afterwards, uh, signing a letter asking Gampo to, to disrobe and not to teach anymore and, you know, saying how bad it was that all of this had happened. And yet some of these same people, when I contacted them, would not talk to me or they, they flat out said that I was making these things up. Mm -hmm. um, so that was interesting, to say the least. So for a long time... Um, after that, I wasn't with any particular group. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I was still ordained. I still practiced, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't disrobe. Mm -hmm. But I didn't. I, I was very wary of, of ties with any organized Zen group. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it's kind of, it took a long time for me to get past that. I think after my experience with uh, Genpo and, mm -hmm. and his Sangha and what happened there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so why you were, so, you know, the, the decade and a half you're practicing with him, like what, yeah. what were you seeing in the practice and what were you seeing in yourself that was bringing you back? Cause you know, Zen practice can be really hard and oh, yeah, yeah. pleasant. So I mean, something was driving you back. You know, can you talk a little bit about your inner experience there? Like what uh -huh. was <laughs> pulling you back uh, to the practice? Okay. Um, I think, well, actually, um, I think the main thing, and it's always been one of my uh, things with Zen practice, is it does what it says on the cat. It does what it claims to do. You know, if you put yourself into the practice mm -hmm. um, and you can be at least willing to be honest with yourself, we're not, we're not always you know, honest with ourselves. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. But if you're willing to at least 
give that some attention and put yourself into the practice it, it, it real stuff starts to happen mm -hmm. um i mean i think there's and a lot of people you know they start saying because they want to be a bit more um settled a bit centered more centered calmer they want to feel better mm -hmm. and sometimes i i think in zen we kind of put that down like it's a lesser approach like we should all be concerned with enlightenment and saving all sentient beings mm -hmm. um but to me those things aren't separate i mean the fact is that we 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 start where we are which seems obvious mm -hmm. but you know very few people start from the standpoint of I'm going to enlighten everything. And if they do, it's kind of, um, I don't want to say there's a problem because they're not understanding mm -hmm. what's going on. Um, so I think for me, the, the, the experiences were those that um, come after that. I, th I think, you know, that you do tend to establish more of uh, a calmness, a clarity, a, mm -hmm. a, a centeredness. And, and those have been well discussed and there's good scientific evidence for them. I think it was more when I was, um, how should we say, feeling, well, even feeling is the wrong word, but, but having a much greater sense of the connection of everything, mm -hmm. um, that we are connected, that we're not separate, that we're interdependent. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it was an experiences that kind of... Um, show glimpses of that mm -hmm. and that we can actually function from that we can actually live from that it's not just necessarily you know some experience that we have and then oh well that's great but what happens next you know mm -hmm. and it's it's um i think it's kind of tempting to to i know i certainly did it want to have more and more experiences like that and we think it's about those experiences and they matter i'm not not saying they don't but um i think far more it's about um how you function in daily life mm -hmm. um you know it's great having some realization in your head or even a wonderful experience where you're <clears throat> you know one with the universe and you know why you were born and what happens after death or whatever all of the all great all wonderful mm -hmm. but if it doesn't make a difference to how you speak to the clerk at the, the store Mm -hmm. or you know how you treat animals or how you even pick up a cup or open the door then there's something missing mm -hmm. um so what uh what drove you to get ordained was it just you want a deeper commitment was there some other dynamic there um <clears throat> i i think it's it's partly as you said wanting a deeper commitment i think it was um <sighs> I, I well, pretty much from the age of 14, I knew, um, odd as it might sound, that I was going to be uh, a, a Buddhist monk or priest. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And the, that's what I wanted the focus of my life to be. I mean, as I understood it at the time. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that, that changes in some ways. Um, but yes, I, I wanted, you know, the Dharma to be uh, central. Mm -hmm. um, and that to be what my life was about and sharing that with other people. Um, and also, you know, to be honest, I think there's also, uh, certainly before getting ordained, I think there were ideas of getting some sort of credential mm -hmm. and being seen as official and having some kind of status. Mm -hmm. And it's all bullshit. I mean, you know, because you know, being ordained in the West, you know, try walking into a Starbucks and getting a coffee with that. It won't work. You know, you still yeah. don't pay. So. <laughs> We, we don't get much respect. Um, in fact, I, I'd say people who are ordained mm -hmm. in the West are probably treated worse in some ways because uh, a lot of our interaction with others, and I'm sure you've experienced this, is online, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the pandemic and things like that. Mm -hmm. And if you go on your average like Facebook Buddhist group or something like this, mm -hmm. you will encounter so much just utter drivel and dross and and nonsense <laughs> and but if you point this out you know people will take great offense mm -hmm. um and then if you point out that you're actually you know an ordained priest that you're kind of official mm -hmm. uh, they they take even greater offense because it's something that the, i think people like that will never ever be 
-hmm. you know, they're, they're not going to um, commit. To, they're, they're, I think most of them don't even train. Um, they don't sit. They're just, it's all in their heads. Um, right. So for them, you know, an actual Zen priest is kind of a target. Um, but yeah, I, I ordained because all of those things. Mm -hmm. Did the um, the the um, the precept component was that how much did that resonate with you? Was that just okay? I'm going to say these precepts to get the you know to pass the threshold, or or do they really resonate with you? Did you study them? You know what what was your relationship to the precepts? Ah, oh, that is my ongoing relationship to the precepts. Yeah. <laughs> um I, at the time yeah I, they were important to me and and they were certainly a factor although they're essentially the same precepts that you take when you take your time mm -hmm. they're not fundamentally different mm -hmm. um, but i think approaching them from the point of view of, of more or less as kinds um, mm -hmm. something to be worked with that presents reality to you in a way that you can, um, how should we say, let yourself be absorbed in the work. Um, and I, I think also the fact that, the, I mean, the precepts to me, one thing I like about them is, A, they're not commandments. They're not, mm -hmm. um, thou shalt not. Right. Some people kind of still have that attitude about them. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, I think it was Tension Rev Anderson, uh, a Zen teacher, who pointed out that um, it's like he used the analogy of a glass, you know, and you use the glass and it gets dirty and then you clean it. So the precepts aren't about this kind of um, always being pure. They're not that kind of uh, approach to morality. It's the understanding that we're going to use the glass, it's going to get dirty we use the precepts just like we use the glass you know things are going to get dirty we're never going to be able to keep them lit literally all the time in fact you shouldn't keep them literally all the time you can't mm -hmm. it's impossible so they're they're real kinds um you know take the koan of of always being truthful mm -hmm. and and one example i've come across quite often is you know what if you're in, uh, you know, Nazi Germany, and the Gestapo come to the door and ask if you've seen the, the Jewish neighbors or something. If you're being truthful and you have, you tell them, and mm -hmm. yes, you're keeping the precept, mm -hmm. but you're breaking the the spirit of the greater precepts. You know, you actually have a moral duty in that case to lie. Mm -hmm. And the precepts, I like the depth of them. I like the fact that they're um, seen as facets of reality not as something that you impose on top of reality so yes they were very important to me they still are mm -hmm. um so at one point you left the uk and you made it to the states is that right yes uh -huh. what well, what motivated that move um actually I, I it was still somewhat idealistic um about zen practice which is not a bad thing by any means mm -hmm. um i'd left as i said i'd left Kanzi on Sangha, I left Gampo. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to experience Zen training where there are probably the most Zen training centers and monasteries outside of Japan, which is the US, mm -hmm. and where I also speak the language, which, I, well, sometimes. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, you guys all speak it wrong. But, uh, yeah. Well, you yeah. spell color wrong, so. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. Aluminium. Yeah. <laughs> Herb. But, um, but I figured that. Um, I would do a kind of pilgrimage mm -hmm. and go from you know Zen center to Zen center and monastery, whatever, and, and train and just kind of work my way around the country and try different Zen centers. I didn't get very far with that, mm -hmm. um, mainly for practical reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I think it's good to actually stay in one place and experience training there for a good while before moving on. It's not you can't do it as a tourist. Where did you go? Um, well, the first place actually I went was Michigan. Okay. Uh, and I started there. There was a uh, Zen center in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. um, and it was run by, I think, Haju Sudim, <clears throat> a female teacher who, yes, uh -huh. uh, Korean, uh, in the lineage of uh, Kusan Sunim, mm -hmm. uh, the Korean Zen teacher. And they had. Uh, I was struck by the similarities and the differences. The similarities were 
you know, the essence of practice was the same um, as in any Zen center I'd been to, or uh, for that matter, any Buddhist center. Um, the differences were things like um, they love bowing. They love doing like these full prostrations um, <clears throat> and doing 108 every morning. Mm -hmm. um, so like going on retreat there um, and doing having to do 108 bows every morning uh, I think before the sitting or after the sitting. Um, I mean, I had thighs like steel after that. But it was, yeah, that was, and I actually really enjoyed that. Um, <clears throat> there was much more physical um, sense of practice. And not just, I, I think sometimes with Zen centers in other traditions, it comes to be focused just on the sitting. <clears throat> and I think that's a mistake. It's much broader than that. And it's very much a body practice too. Our, our sitting isn't, as much something that happens up in our heads as we tend to think mm -hmm. um, it's very much a body practice so yes my first experience um and where i was for about, i think two and a half years three years around that time was with um Haju Sunim in ann arbor and she was uh, still is a wonderful teacher really really good did you um, have a lot of direct contact with her yes quite a bit um mm -hmm. and i i still remember going into dakasan with her uh -huh. and spending about five minutes solid um, being told that I, I couldn't open and close the door mindfully. Uh -huh. um, and then, of course, trying to open and close the door mindfully, which is a contradiction in terms, uh -huh. uh, in a real sense. So, yeah, I remember that. Um, and she was dead right. You know, I was, I was up in my head. Uh -huh. um, and she was very, very clear. She was very uh, to the point. Um, and I really liked her presentation, her way of doing things, and the the Korean practice in general. Can, um, can, can you talk about other aspects of the practice other than the bowing? Well, they, they again, they have koans, or, or more, I think, closer to uh, what they call hardu, or word head, mm -hmm. which is almost like taking one word or phrase or aspect of a koan and, and absorbing yourself with that in particular. So it's kind of, um, it might seem less nuanced than like the Rinzai approach, where you often have many different facets of, of a koan. You have capping phrases, you have um, all sorts of things around the koan, and you have the whole case, and, you know, it's quite a big deal. And I think Hardu kind of distills all of that. Um, and I think there's merits to both. Mm -hmm. um but it, it's it's a very interesting way of working with with um koans and with practice but other than that it was also uh the similarities you know there's the same um posture breathing working with breathing mm -hmm. um so it's very much and i find the same thing in Theravadan groups in vajrayana groups in zen groups mm -hmm. you know the core of the practice is the same in many ways did um what was the energy like there was it intense was it relaxed you know what it was, it was yeah good question um it was both actually which I, I find fascinating too um it was intense in that you know people really cared about practice they really wanted to to uh give themselves to it and it showed and that has an effect you know you don't have people just kind of oh well yeah shit i may as well do this and just you know half-assed um that was another thing that struck me nobody was being half-assed about things um, but at the same time it was a very warm and welcoming atmosphere it didn't have that kind of um almost militant minimalist samurai mentality that i've come across in some zen places mm -hmm. um, in particular mm -hmm. um so yes very welcoming and warm and relaxed in that sense but on the other hand also very very uh intense training so it was a very good mixture of both i'd say were there retreats there yep um yeah they did the full-on retreats uh, i think they're called yong main yong jing something like that my pronunciation is probably terrible mm -hmm. um i think i only did uh, like a week long but they had like if i remember correctly like month-long ones as well mm -hmm. um <clears throat> and was this a residential center or or a plate or Place where people kind of show up to sit but don't necessarily live 
Uh, more the, the latter. The teacher was resident there, mm -hmm. but uh, and I think there were a couple of people with her uh, who would be residents at a time, mm -hmm. um, and they were uh, do their training that way. Mm -hmm. um, but the majority of people came along and kind of you know, came along for the sitting and the retreats and, and Dharma talks and events and things like that. So, and so pretty much, I think, like most um, Zen centers in the U.S. So what? Um, where did you go after that? Um, <clears throat> after that, well, I moved. I then moved to um, <clears throat> New York State, um, and I actually went along to um, Zen Mountain Monastery. With, with Dido, with, um, yeah, with Dido uh, mm -hmm. briefly, and Dido was 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 great. Mm -hmm. Actually, I really enjoyed him, although it was only it was very brief. Mm -hmm. uh, literally only a few days um, and of course beautiful place but I didn't want to get involved in a formal Zen group as such and and there was after that I kind of I think I kind of drifted around pretty much just doing my own uh, sitting or not sitting sometimes as well as the time mm -hmm. um, and I had a kind of I think a crisis of, I, I don't know if crisis of faith is the right way, way to put it, but um, I wanted to sort out what I knew from what I believed. Mm -hmm. um, because belief to me is what we tell ourselves when we don't know. Mm -hmm. It's the stories we tell ourselves when we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted to focus on what I actually knew and what was real. Um, and I wanted to step back from the whole formal um, Zen practice and Buddhist practice. Um, so I would run sitting groups, um, but I'd make it clear that I was a meditation teacher, not a Zen teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a big difference. Um, and if anybody came to me and wanted a teacher, I would promptly point them in the direction of somebody else mm -hmm. um, uh, who was formally authorized to teach. Um, in a in a lineage um or even non-zen teachers if if that was their you know if they wanted another tradition mm -hmm. so i was kind of doing my own thing um and being a meditation teacher who also happened to be ordained not being a zen teacher and i did that for some years um mm -hmm. until eventually uh, shoji uh, and i got communicating mm -hmm. And he basically, in no uncertain terms, made it clear that I was copping out, um, that I was kind of, I was doing the Pracheka Buddha thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, it's all, it's my practice. And, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, 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 I can't get my hands dirty with other people and all of this. I mean, yes, I wasn't a formal teacher. I had no right to, to claim to be a, a Zen teacher, but at the same time, it was still a cop out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I had stuff to offer. Um, I had training. I had, in his eyes, presumably some insight. You know, many would question that, but mm -hmm. I won't argue with my teacher. So, mm -hmm. um, so he, he pointed out there was basically a copper. I was coasting. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and he was right. Mm -hmm. It was a way of avoiding things. You know, I could be kind of comfortable in my own practice and doing an informal sitting group every week um but i was avoiding going any any deeper or any further with training um so i took up the challenge um mm -hmm. and began working with shoji mm -hmm. so yeah did um given that you're already uh had yukai and in, in ordination mm -hmm. you didn't do that again under the clear mind banner correct <clears throat> actually i did do um ordination i reordained okay. mm -hmm. um because I wanted a a clean kind of break with, I mean, you know, you, you can never have a complete break with the past. The past is in the present. But um, I wanted to, I, it's the only way I can put it, yeah, kind of have a clean break with uh, the past and that I was becoming part of a new tradition. I thought the right thing to do would be to reordain. Um, which also meant kind of starting at the beginning again. You know, I was an unsui, a, a priest in training. Mm -hmm. uh, I was at the bottom of the toilet. I, I, I was the toilet cleaner, as Shoji likes to point out. 
-hmm. that, that would be my duty. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going back to the beginning, which I actually don't have much of a problem with, um, because I have a tendency towards being arrogant and I know it. Um, so for me, going back to the beginning can work as a kind of antidote to that. Um, and it's the same in practice. You know, often I will go back to like things that are supposed to be beginner exercises, like counting the breathing. Mm -hmm. um, and often I will actually go back to them because the whole idea of beginner and experienced and a lot of it is wrong. A lot of it is well, wrong in the sense that it's um, a misunderstanding. You know, that actually just sitting with our breath or even counting the breath, these are really deep, powerful practices. And we kind of, I think some Zen students get the impression that there's something to be gotten out of the way. And then we move on to the real stuff, which is like koans or shikantaza. Mm -hmm. And it's not like that. I mean, to me, they're, they're kind of inseparable. Right? I think, I don't know if you've experienced this, but sometimes when you sit, for example, if you're, uh, say following the breathing uh, then naturally it kind of it will it will at some point naturally quite naturally you're just sitting mm -hmm. you know there's just you don't you're no longer just uh, trying to focus on one thing it's just sitting um, yeah. or you'll get a natural kind of koan that comes up and yeah. you can't avoid it yeah I, uh, um, you know i started off in soto and even if I try doing another type of sitting, I just muscle memory hmm. result, go back to like just sitting. I, it's, yeah. I, I have no choice. It just happens. It's really weird, you know. Yeah. And, and, and the one irony about it, um, I don't know about for you, uh, is when somebody asks me how to just sit. Hmm. Um, and it's like you can do it, but trying to tell somebody how to do it, it's, it's, it's hard because there's no method. There's literally no technique. It's not, um, you know, do A, B, C, and then D will happen. And it's, it's, and for me, that, that's part of the, the great thing, um, oddly, about Soto, about Shikantaza, um, because we live in an insane society where everything is about doing something as a means to an end. Mm -hmm. Everything is about achieving a certain result. And a, a lot of this is why we, we find it so difficult to just be present. Because uh, we're always focused on uh, the future. We're always focused on the result. Um, and the Buddha actually talked about you know, not doing things in order to do something else. Uh, the whole thing about karma is it's volitional action and its results. Um, and the natural aspect of there not being a fixed, rigid, permanent self, you know, there is no uh, substantive I in here. Um, the, the, the corollary of that is the fact that, in a sense, we don't meditate, we don't practice. Mm -hmm. We approach it that way conventionally. Mm -hmm. But you know from your own experience with Shikantaza that what's happening is that the we kind of, at least for a little while, kind of drop that or some of that at least. And there's just sitting. And it's kind of, yeah, we do keep going back to it. I think I read somewhere, some teacher saying that even with something like breath counting or whatever, <clears throat> you know, there's an element almost of shikantaza there, of just sitting there. Mm -hmm. And that you couldn't do this practice if there wasn't. Mm -hmm. You know, because in a sense, it's not the, the self that does it. And yet we, we talk about it in that way. You know, my practice and my sitting and I do this and I do that. Mm -hmm. But the reality is when we actually just sit and we kind of <clears throat> allow ourselves to get out of the way, then sitting does itself mm -hmm. and the practice does itself. So, yeah, I can completely understand why you go back to just sitting. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even have a choice. It just it's such exactly. A, yeah, it's such a muscle memory for me. It, it, exactly. There, there is a there is a brief period where um, yeah, I went to Ring of Bones and though in um, near Nevada City, and that, that's an Aiken Roshi place. Oh, there, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and there I, you know, I did like formal moo, right? You know, yeah. I was assigned moo, and I'd sit down, okay, moo, and just within seconds, I'd be back in Shikantaza. I just, right, <laughs> right. I, it's just what my body knows what to do, you know, like, yes. uh, you know, um, 
Yeah. But so, you I, you also know though that fundamentally there's there's no real difference, right? Uh yeah, I mean I I didn't so I so I I you know my main practice is with shoji, but I also um um do koans um uh you know through um white plum kind of as a secondary practice. And even there, um like I don't I don't I don't focus on the koan when I'm sitting, you know. I might, I might think about it right before and it becomes a theme, or you know. But I'm still just, I'm still just sitting, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 You snuck under their radar. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. um, <laughs> anything else of um, John's uh, working with Shoji stands out? Oh, uh, where do I begin? Um, I think. <clears throat> <laughs> some of the things that make me laugh he has a very um say no nonsense approach uh, as you as you well know yeah i love it um, he's very fond of telling me that there's no unicorns or rainbows mm -hmm. um you know he's very much uh, not into like the fantasies and the mm -hmm. um all the kind of uh, new age bullshit that kind of a lot of people bring to practice and they have these ideas about practice and, and uh, spirituality in general mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there's all unicorns and rainbows he's very fond of, of puncturing that um, <clears throat> and also you know to be reminded that he um he is and was a, a karateka he was a karate student mm -hmm. and so he's is then you know told me numerous times how he would break every bone in my body um and that was so that was that was interesting um you know how he would do it technically and how how quick it, he could do it and um so I, I think yes i mean all said in jest i mean obviously it's not <clears throat> genuinely threatening me um but yeah i find his his sense of humor his um not having any time for kind of what he sees as things that aren't essential mm -hmm. um, i like um I, I also like the fact that we can actually quite fundamentally disagree and i think this is one of the main things about choji mm -hmm. we can fundamentally disagree about some things mm -hmm. but still um <clears throat> work with each other and still you know kind of respect each other and still and it, it doesn't interfere with our relationship as a student and teacher Mm -hmm. whereas i've come across other teachers and you disagree with them that's kind of a a major thing um, <clears throat> and so there's there's none of that we showed you mm -hmm. so you got uh so you had a sitting group you know it, it, um people might not know this but in clear mind zen you know part of your tr a, a, a priest training you know a novice priest mm -hmm. training is your is your you need to do some sort of you know, dharma service project yeah some people um you know work as um you know a chaplain some people start sitting groups some people do you know prison chaplaincy and right. so forth your, yours was a sitting group is that right um well it, it's a few things we also mm -hmm. work with um we're trying to <clears throat> expand um dharma resources if you want to put it that way practice resources for people in the hispanic community mm -hmm. um well there hasn't been a lot of attention paid at all um, in the us <clears throat> and also um particularly with those who are undocumented mm -hmm. um, working with them as an immigrant myself um is something i feel very strongly about mm -hmm. um and and these are people who are often excluded or not thought of um, and they can benefit from practice the same as anyone else, and it should be available to them. Um, so we do that. We um, um, <clears throat> do the sitting group as well. The, the sitting group at the moment is is online mm -hmm. um, because of the pandemic. Right. Um, and to be honest, that I'm really, really struggling with. Um, I have real difficulties with that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> because I, I think it is vital to have at least at some point, a kind of interaction between teacher and students and between students and students, mm -hmm. um, which you don't really get on Zoom. And so for me, that's a problem. I don't know how you approach it. And if you if you have any solutions, let me know. But um, um, 
I think the only practical option I can see is getting another booster and then opening up to, to in-person sitting more. Yeah, um, places are doing it. Yeah. yeah I, uh, I don't have a teaching, you know, student, student teacher relationship with anyone there, but I sit a lot with their local soda group. And, you know, we, and they've been, you know, they're, they're basically back to business full time. You know, there's, right. you know, not, and they've even got a point where they're not wearing masks. Like a lot of times I'll be the only one in the room with a mask. I, yeah, I, did, would. <laughs> I would. When, when we did the session, I, so I did one uh, two day session and I tried wearing a mask the whole time. And that was just, you know, because mm -hmm. when I'm breathing out of my mouth, like uh, probably no one wants to hear this, but you know, that mucus starts running down my oh, yeah, yeah. Mouth, yeah. nose in my mouth. So I'm sitting there for half an hour, you know, drinking my own burgers. Yep. And so I tried that for two days and I didn't want to do that again. <laughs> so, so the last time I went to a, a session there, I, um, I just didn't wear a mask and, right. you know, I just, yeah, and it was, it was, um, I'm not gonna lie. It was pretty wonderful just to be able oh, to. Oh yeah. I mean, the thing is, yeah, the things that we kind of take for granted until we don't have them anymore. Yeah. Um, and and the thing is, too, I've got to move quickly because the way I see it, there's maybe a month um, when I can have like the sitting group actually meet mm -hmm. and people be with people. And then we've got this other wave of um, COVID coming mm -hmm. and it's already starting to explode. So I, I think another month it's going to be back to masks again. Um, I, I think I'll still do the sitting group if everybody is vaccinated um, and wearing masks. But yeah, doing a sashin with with a mask, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's a new form of torture. I think. Yeah, I mean, it was only two days. But it was, it was rough. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I'd find that so difficult. Yeah. What? Well, um, which, of course, you know, sashin being hard is its own beauty. But I mean, <laughs> that's one but, way to put but, it. I mean, yeah. it was just functionally. I don't even know how to explain it, but um, so about a year ago, you got Dharma transmission, if I remember yeah. correctly. Um, has, has that changed your practice at all? Completely and not at all. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, it has. Um, I mean, in one way, it's kind of something that I've avoided for a long time. Um, I avoided that whole thing of more or less functioning as a teacher but not wanting to be a teacher um i had to confront that um and that led to me questioning all my ideas of what a teacher is um you know that, that they're not these sort of um <clears throat> amazingly powerful uh enlightened in quotes beings you know they're normal human beings who happen to um have put in enough uh, training to actually have some kind of insight and be able to to help others in some ways uh, not by taking responsibility for them mm -hmm. but by getting them uh, at least to see where some of the blind spots are you know i think that's that's what one of the best things a teacher can do so it's more or less all the mistakes that i've made mm -hmm. I can recognize. So it's only because I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> and I'm a really slow learner. I, I think that helps in some ways. Um, it's not some great spiritual wisdom and insight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a lot of the time it's just cutting through bullshit. It's cutting through the excuses that we give ourselves and the stories we tell ourselves to, to <clears throat> avoid being with things as they are um so a teacher to me you know my primary function is to be there for others um <clears throat> it's not for me it's it's not about me in that sense um so i'm always wary of somebody for example who refers to themselves as a zen master hmm. you know, first of all i think you should never do that uh, generally i think it's just rude and secondly it should be something that somebody else confers on you. it's not a, a self-appointing thing have you ever read Harry Potter? Yes, yes, yeah. I have. Why? Yeah, so you know the term "muggle," right? I, I remember yeah, one yeah. Time there was a there was a discussion online, and someone said "Zen master," and someone said, "Well, you know, Zen master is kind of a muggle word. You know, people don't really use that within serious Zen yeah. within serious Zen communities." I thought that was really funny. Yeah, I mean, I mean, some do, but yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, um, it's kind of yeah, it's kind of if you have to say 
that about yourself, you're not it. You know, so it's kind of like alpha males. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as somebody says they're an alpha male, I think, no, you're really not, you know. <laughs> um, so for me, it kind of has the, the same, same thing. But, um, and also the fact that people confuse Zen teachers and Zen masters, and they're not the, the same at all. Um, so I'm a Zen teacher. I am not a Zen master. Um, <clears throat> And for me, it is it is very much about offering um, dharma and practice for other people, um, and just being a kind of um, how should we say sounding board, or, or uh, uh, I've heard some teachers say almost like a mirror, you know, to other people. Mm -hmm. um, it's not about imposing my will on others and and setting up this wonderful. Um, expensive center where only rich people can come um, mm -hmm. which i've seen happen mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the upper middle way yeah the, yeah right exactly the upper middle way yeah um you know i i want <clears throat> i want dharma to be as accessible as it can be um and i say as it can be because it's not going to be for everybody in the sense that it's not going to ever be that popular Mm -hmm. um it's not a, necessarily a fun thing to do you know to sit still and be quiet and resist the temptation to avoid being present uh, a lot of the time that's really boring um but that boredom kind of uh, shifts something in us if we if we keep with it um and it's it's hard to explain that to people who haven't practiced um, I, I remember a story from one uh, teacher, I can't remember who it was, but um, apparently they were sitting in a cabin in the woods doing like a, I think a seven day retreat um, in this like big cabin or whatever. Um, and suddenly they, they uh, <clears throat> somebody knocked on the door and there's a, you know, a couple of guys out there with beers, <clears throat> like cans of beers and stuff. Um, and they had assumed <clears throat> but the only reason that somebody they were like neighbors that somebody would be in this cabin <clears throat> for several days like this, obviously from the city mm -hmm. is to party mm -hmm. and so they were stunned when it turned out this was a zen group and they kind of asked him well what do you do and then you know the, the it had to be explained to them well you sit still and you you know kind Start of look at a wall yeah 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 and and you know focus on your breathing and posture mm -hmm. and that's it and so of course these guys thought that was nuts that's insane you know? it is. yeah um <clears throat> it is it, it it is uh counterculture in the true sense of the term because against, it's against the, against the grain does that have the beautiful yeah as yeah. as the buddha put it yeah against the stream against the grain um because everything that we come across, there's this constant stimulation to be uh, looking outside and, and looking to something else or somebody else for a, a solution. Um, and that you can often buy a solution or take a solution. You know, you take a pill and it will cure the problem. Um, <clears throat> and Buddhism for me is, is the exact opposite. It's, it's learning that you don't have to look outside of yourself to not in a selfish way but it just in the sense that you have everything that it takes to <clears throat> be more more sane <clears throat> excuse me mm -hmm. and to actually see things clearly um <clears throat> that it doesn't come from somebody else i mean yeah we have teachers and we have senior students and all of that but um their actual their, their job is to make it easier for you in a sense um it feels harder at times but it's to make it easier in the longer term you know they're actually there to support other people uh -huh. <clears throat> and it's not they're not there as a kind of you know somebody on a throne or a dais who's telling you what to think and what to believe and i think that's actually hard for some people they want that they want um an authority figure who's going to tell them what to do uh -huh. I remember, then, uh, I remember a teacher, I won't say who, <coughs> for privacy reasons, but teachers stopped working with a student because it's like, student wanted me to be a therapist, I'm not their therapist. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's another good point. I think um, 
I mean, to an extent, you can't avoid um, going into areas that traditionally therapy would deal with mm -hmm. um, because you are working with people's whole lives and their emotions and what's going on in their lives. But at the same time, um, we're not therapists, or at least, you know, unless you've been trained to be a therapist, but then teachers are not therapists. Um, and I think it, it's helpful to bear in mind that it, there's also a certain value in encouraging people to realize that they solve their own problems and that they are, it sounds kind of harsh, but that they're on their own in a fundamental sense. Mm -hmm. But that's the paradox is that we're actually on our own with each other. <laughs> I think that's the thing about Sangha. It's, um, yeah, you have to do the work and nobody's going to take responsibility for you. And, and no guru is going to make it magically all better. But at the same time, you're with a bunch of other people who are doing the same thing and you can actually support each other. So for me, you know, Sangha is, is also vital, you know, that sense of community. And that's one problem I have with uh, Zoom. Um, but yeah, so the... And, and people, it's like the three treasures, you know, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. They like one or two, but not all three of them. Like they'll like the teacher or the Buddha, or they'll like the Dharma as, as an idea, but they're not so keen on Sangha, you know. And so a lot of practice, I think, is getting us to recognize where we have um, these kind of resistance. I, I mean, to me, practice is always about working with some kind of resistance and just making that conscious and yeah there'll be an overlap with with therapy to some extent but i think it's also um <clears throat> much deeper in some way but having said that and you know thank you for reminding me about the thing about therapy i think a lot of um zen students or particularly some who become teachers is there can be a tendency to assume that Zen practices and even realization experiences, enlightenment experiences, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. kind of fix us. And they don't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we still have our um, shadows to deal with, um, to use kind of therapeutic language. And I think some of the problems we've encountered with Zen, uh, particularly in the West, <clears throat> are because teachers haven't done that work. So that they haven't really worked with the shadow side. They haven't really um, looked closely enough at that. And, you, and that's an issue. That's, do you think that's kind of part of the problem Skimpo had? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, I don't want to comment too much on intent and motivation and all the rest of it. Um, but yes, I certainly, I, I think at the risk of oversimplifying, I think some of the things that you come across in practice that you kind of um, tend to come up, mm -hmm. which seem um, like really uh, kind of important, powerful, good things, um, certain qualities that you might uncover. Mm -hmm. um, I think they can be misused. Um, <clears throat> and I think also the, the tendency is if we haven't um, quite seen deeply enough, if you want to put it that way, or at least have awareness of our shadow, that we tend to assume that these things are ours, they're our personal property, they, they belong to us, they make us special. Um, so charisma, for example, or you know, uh, qualities like that. Um, and I think if we get stuck there, that's when problems tend to happen, because we're confusing some things that can quite naturally come up with something that's personal that we own. And then, you know, that whole ownership thing, it, it's, it's, as we know, it's part of the problem. This is one reason why there is uh, suffering in the way that there is, is because we, we think we own stuff and we think we're in control and we're really not. You, you know, Uchi, uh, Uchiyama, Uchiyama Roshi, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, so his teacher was uh, Koto, Koto Roshi. Koto Suwaki, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, and I guess Koto was, you know, very charismatic and powerful and so forth, where right. uh, Uchiyama was kind of meek and nerdy and, you right. know, and, um, 
And I think at one time Uchiyama said, you know, asked Koto, you know, if, if, if I keep doing Zazen, am I going to be like you and powerful? And he's like, and Koto's like, no, Zazen is useless. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. And it, it's kind of, yeah. And then that, that's kind of a great story. It's, it's interesting. And that's, because that's quite a, a clan in a way, um, <laughs> too, because, um, it, it is useless in the sense that it's not going to, um, you know, the you that is the problem isn't just going to permanently disappear. Mm -hmm. You know, even when you see through it, <clears throat> it's kind of, it serves a function. And we also need a kind of healthy functioning ego mm -hmm. um, in that sense. But yeah, it's not going to <coughs> magically transform you in the way that some people think. Mm -hmm. um, but also at the same time, I think there is a certain quality, I think, to people who uh, do practice in a way that, that keeps them centered in reality. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say, it's, I mean, what you touch on to me speaks of ordinariness. You know, people are just ordinary. They're just themselves. But that in itself is so unusual in this day and age, particularly, that it's extraordinary. It, it is literally extraordinary um, because so many people are trying to be somebody else, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and like with Uchi, I'm very, and the interesting thing about uh, Kodo Sawaki, the, the, the only times roughly when Kodo Sawaki is brought up is when people talk about his sayings, mm -hmm. you know, whereas the, the kind of the real legacy, I mean, the legacy, yes, in, in terms of his successes, but the real legacy is like people like Uchiyama Roshi and the, the kind of patient, steady work that they did. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the unremarkable, <clears throat> apparently uncharismatic Uchiyama Roshi, and yet he, it could be said, is more significant, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of what he's actually done. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering sometimes if charisma um, is actually a barrier rather than a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, certainly charisma can come across as power and realization where really mm. it's just charisma. Yeah, yeah that, that's the thing too. Yeah. It's very easy to kind of um, get sucked into uh, you know, what's going on with somebody who has a lot of charisma. Mm. And I think that happened with um, you know several Zen teachers where <clears throat> they may have started off as being really clear. Excuse me, sorry, my throat. <clears throat> and um, being very good teachers in that sense. But then people started responding to the charisma, not the teaching. Mm -hmm. And then I think at, at some point, some teachers kind of, it, it's easy to kind of get off on that. You know, it's easy to kind of, start buying into the thing that it makes you somehow special and important mm -hmm. um i mean we are all special and important but not in the way that uh, <clears throat> the ego likes to have it um, do you know the um zen teacher barry magic yeah 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 yeah, yeah. So, someone i have a lot of respect for but uh, i was listening to one of his dharma talks once and i thought it was pretty funny he I, i'm probably gonna mangle this um anecdote but he was saying something like you know, maybe the best thing about me is being your teacher is you're not coming to me for the charisma, you know, because he, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. he could be a little bit of a Bueller, Bueller, you know, uh -huh. type of, you know, Dharma talker, but you know, he's very super low key and mellow and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I found that with a few teachers, um, you know, Norman Fisher is one that comes to mind. Um, it's a quiet charisma though. I don't know if I'd call it charisma. I, I think yeah. <clears throat> he's just I, so relaxed and comfortable. Yeah, I, I, yeah. It, I it, think yeah. Yeah, just you can't help but re be relaxed around him, you know. Yes, I think that certainly helps. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think because there are those teachers who are kind of very dynamic. Um, <clears throat> they come across as very kind of strong and quite powerful, mm -hmm. and that's a perfectly valid way of doing things. In fact, that's vital at times. I think. Um, and then there are teachers who are much more uh, <clears throat> understated mm -hmm. and low key. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
and we tend to overlook them. You know, they don't stand out as much. Um, but I think looking at them in terms of um, what they have to say and how they kind of actually embody what they're saying is uh, can be very impressive. You know, mm -hmm. and we miss that if we focus on the on the charisma. Mm -hmm. Um, you want to wrap up or keep going or um yeah I'm, you know that's, I, I have to go actually yeah. go and sit and stuff yeah. but um if, if you uh, want to do another one sometime that would be yeah, great I'd love to. definitely i'd love to I, I would actually ask like to ask you some more questions because i've done a lot of talking so yeah. um if someone uh wanted to connect with you what would be the best way for them to do so um <clears throat> probably well there's the the website um, okay which is uh smiling okay and uh, we got the dot com not because it's commercial but because it was cheaper so mm -hmm. i'm a cheap ass mm -hmm. so i didn't get the dot org mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's um smiling is the website okay um <clears throat> or they can always reach me on facebook mm -hmm. So, but I, I take time off from Facebook now and again. So, probably the website will be more uh, reliable. Okay, great. Well, delighted to have this conversation with you, and I look forward to the next one. Likewise, and you do good interviews, by the way. And I'm mostly just listening. To yeah, you see, well, there you go. Yes, oh. <clears throat> no, it helps. But um, and thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, until next thank time. You.